Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. The title is When Time Tested Our Humanity. And so in the chat section, excuse me, in the subtitle of the video, I've written Timeless Flights of Attention Beyond the Void, and I would like to speak about uh, humanity's psychological relationship with time as we go through it. You know, <clears throat> there's moments where I wonder about the significance of meaning, I can tell you that it's been uh, some years now where I have truly wondered about theories of how we know things. And you know, it's like you can't be a creature opening your eyes in a world for the first time and not have questions. <clears throat> so in some sense, time is a very important area uh, of questioning. You know, it is in some sense... Uh, how the world uh, receives us and how we receive the world. That's a really good way of explaining time, I think. And uh, before... Excuse me. Before I can talk about the human being's relationship in time, I have to explain time. There's some factors about time. <clears throat> One thing about time is that the child is not born with a watch on its hand. The child is not born, the newborn child doesn't have a psychology, doesn't have a personality. Yet the world goes forth and changes. So you can say, before we acknowledge the concept of time, reality is just changing. And so when we attain, when we in some sense um, solidify into an identity as an individual, then change is interpreted as time or as how space moved in time, you know. You know, there was um, a concept uh, in ancient Greece about time, the ancient Greek philosophers had two types of time. They called it chronos and kairos. Chronos was spelled C-H-R-O-N-U-S or O-S and kairos was spelled K-A-I, if I remember correctly, R-O-S. <clears throat> and so chronos and kairos were, they were both time, but they were two types of time. And you could imagine yourself in ancient Greece, you know, being a person living in ancient Greece and looking at the mountain, uh, excuse me, looking at the clouds <clears throat> and being like, all right, the gods are walking above those clouds. So back in the day, there was a metaphysical realism to experience uh, rather than just the physical realism. Now in 2020, it's easy to be in some sense uh, a materialist. Back in the day, the dis discrimination between what is inner and outer was very different. What that means is it's like, just like we thought we were a body, we saw there was a mind, we thought we were a, a mind, we noticed there's something more there. So if you were in ancient Greece, and let's say there was the intervention of the gods, let's say you were late to like, let's say you worked in the barracks back in the day, <clears throat> in ancient Greeks, in some barracks, and so you were late, or let's say you were a soldier on the battlefield, <clears throat> and you had this feeling, uh, uh, and of course, uh, I forgot to um, explain Kronos and Kairos. Kronos is chronological, it is pretty much man's conception of time. And I would say Kairos is divine timing. <clears throat> or I would say intervention of the divine in time. That means it's as if like, it's, it'll be a similar distinction. You know how some people say there's a time to do things, you know, and there's a time not to do things. It's like that time to do things is kind of like Kairos.
So anyways, there was two notions of time and the concept of time, ultimately, I mean, the most simplest way we, we explain it, it's, uh, it's how we have measured change in space. That means matter exists and matter moves. As it moves, it changes. As it changes, it relocates to itself. It's re-pinpointed in space and time. <clears throat> so one thing about time is that it's not natural. It's man-made. In ancient times, they had this concept of a divine angle to the time pretty much. Now, when I say when time tests our humanity, I mean that even if we have the concept or of time or not, there is existence here. That means, you know, they say <clears throat> some people just exist and some people live. And I would say those people who live, they are conscious of their mortality. They are conscious of their time. Like, I'll be honest, something that's motivating me to give these talks is because of a feeling that uh, I'm, you know, that there will come a time where I will require to exit the realm, you know? <clears throat> and what's very fascinating about life is that people are never just one person. That's the power of time and space. They categorize our psyche, pretty much the inner realm, <clears throat> is like one it's like one endless film and our physical uh, cycle of going from consciousness to unconsciousness to consciousness to unconsciousness wake up sleep wake up sleep wake up sleep it cuts up this film and we identify those cut up frames of the film as selfhood as our sense of self And personally, guys, I perceive the concept of, a, of time like a coin, <clears throat> especially ever since hearing this quote from Plato where he says, time is the moving image of eternity. That means it's as if beyond an understanding of time, man accesses the context of the deathless. Because death is a certain movement in time, you know, we're like, a, <clears throat> honestly, what it is, is we're all like candles. That's why I'm telling you, that when, I, when the Dalai Lama says compassion, <clears throat> when Gandhi says non-violence, you know why? Because it's like war, it's like candles that should be lighting up other candles are actually melting each other quicker. And so, when I say when time tests our humanity, I'm also referring to that which passes the test of time. <clears throat> and I will tell you, um, the human progress in time is ideological. That means we look at people from thousands of years ago, they had a sort of unique ideological approach to the moment. We look at people alive now, they have a different uh, uh, ideological approach. But one thing that has been in common, one thing <clears throat> that time cannot touch is universality of existence. What that means is it's our humanism. I will tell you, in the future, there may be androids, you know, walking in the streets. There may be, in the very far future, there may be extraterrestrials. Uh, human beings might have established extraterrestrial <clears throat> diplomatic relationships with, like, some other civilization. And aliens are walking in the streets and they're citizens of the advanced civilization. Who knows, right? <clears throat> the future can be very strange, but one thing that the human being has an advantage of is that regardless of any inner realm event that is uh, shared with it, our biology keeps us human. So what I mean by that is like a human being can close their eyes and be like, yo, I just flew all around the universe, man. But it's our humanism that keeps us stabilized. So it's as if the task of the future generations in the future, it's hilarious. It's as if <clears throat> they have to fight uh, against their own inner realm's desire to dehumanize them uh, in order to protect the outer realm. Because the mind, I speak about it, I'm trying to speak about it uh, through the human context, but I will tell you a mind is not something that belongs to just a human being. The mind is a field of activity. So humanity, our species retaliation against time is not to forget the simplicity, the decency, the gracefulness of being human. This is something where I will tell you, um, sometimes when I look at my life, I, I feel I, I might have dedicated 
a, a lot of it to <clears throat> you know the inner realms you know that means if you could kind of get a ratio of a human being living more as a body uh, than a mind or living more as a mind than a body I would say that uh, right now in in, in in our current civilization we don't have the proper balance <clears throat> that means to me there's a it, it's as if sometimes I feel I'm I'm the first uh, in a room where many people after me are gonna enter you know <clears throat> that's what it feels to me you know sometimes that um, it's as if if human beings are living at a ratio of 50 percent uh, physical phenomena 50 percent non-physical phen phenomena living more as a mind than a body means living like 80 percent non-physical and 20 percent physical so your your 20 percent physical <clears throat> experience of the day it becomes limited so what that means is there's some people who they have way more desires in the outer realms than the inner realms and there are those who have been acquainted with the nature of their inner realm so regardless of even if they have a biological physical body their mind is active <clears throat> you know the inner realms has a momentum guys this is something nobody talks about but imagination has a speed the faster it speeds up, the quicker it becomes non-dual. It's the same also if it really slows down. If your imagination get, becomes slower than the body, it becomes non-dual. That means if the mind is slower than the body, you become a materialist. If the mind is faster than the body, you become an immaterialist. Or the inner realms, the, your, your imagination, let's say. So human beings, anyways, let me go to this idea that human beings, what is, what is the most basic thing? I mean, some scholars say the human being is born in two worlds. <clears throat> what are these two worlds? <clears throat> there's the world from the beginning of its birth and to the moment it dies. And then there's a world here that was here before us. And there was a world that will be here after us, right? So those are the two worlds, the world that you will, pretty much there's a world that we never get to see because we weren't born before, <clears throat> we weren't here before our birth, and we're not going to be here after our death physically. So there is the body's life, and then there is the, un there's the known body's life, and then there's the unknown mind's life. Now, for example, me, sometimes when I think about what I'm doing, <clears throat> like for example with this project, is that I kind of feel I have dedicated um, uh, the time of the first world from the beginning of my life to the moment where I transition out of here to the world that was here before and after. And you know how many people have shunned me? <clears throat> you know how many people have told me I am wrong? But you know something within me tells me to keep going this direction. You know, because most human thought is that we're here for a little while, uh, excuse my language, but fuck everything else. If you're here for a little while, just you just advance your own experience, you know. <clears throat> Do you know how many wisdom traditions I've looked into where the wisdom tradition is saying, yo, love everyone, but the world is an illusion, don't touch it. And you know, how can you love the world if you don't engage it? You know, we uh, can't ignore that every person on their deathbed will most likely be, at so, uh, will have the idea that, whoa, I was an energetic event. Where did this energetic event lead? <clears throat> it's as if I had opened my eyes in a civilization that for 4.5 billion years had trained to reach this pedestal of intelligence. You know, sometimes when I see violence and cruelty, I don't get sad, I get angry. Why do I get angry? Because there's another way the moment could have been lived. It's as if our brains uh, are like a Ferrari, but a violent person is driving it at 10 miles per hour. It's such a slow speed of their intelligence. You know, and the reason compassion is prioritized, <clears throat> why, why do so many traditions, wisdom traditions say love? Because love, means you accept the world to understand it it's an acceptance that means if somebody doesn't accept that we're intelligent human beings it doesn't matter how many intelligent conversations we have right now we could be like our species is foolish we could feel our species has way more we could literally be a pessimistic species 
but you know I in my inner realm sometimes the future I, I see glimpses of it and you know what I see I see a generation of human beings that will be born and they will be in anguish they will be the anguish of not knowing literally on the wall on the verge of should I be a cyberspace infinitude or should I be a natural eternity you know that means it's gonna be a sort of the, the, the biggest decision of the human mind shall it go towards the sky or shall it stay on earth till the end of time you know <clears throat> you know guys I don't know if um, <clears throat> people have experienced this but I've had moments where um, where my mind has hinted to its own exit And you know, it's like you have something and you don't know you have it until it's taken away. And if the species has a hidden opportunity of life, does it, did it attempt it? That is the question. St. Francis of Assisi says one of the most incredible statements. St. Francis of Assisi says it is in dying to self that we are born to eternal life. You know, that means a person can have, excuse me, can have an idea of self. And a person can be in a state where that idea of self goes away and then the world reveals itself. That means for the first time, the caterpillar archetype has become synonymous with the uh, ego. Or another metaphor of transformation would be the egg. <laughs> <clears throat> where people say when an egg breaks from the outside there is no life when the egg breaks from the inside there is life and so when humanity awakens from within there is infinity or there is eternity and I would say if humanity awakens from the outside we can say there is infinity <clears throat> that means what are the options? We keep this algorithm of biological continuity just uh, repeating. Or we move beyond our eyes in ways that we may not be human anymore. Our species will only survive if there is a level of trust. And I don't know how a person can trust anything if they don't consider it to be true. <clears throat> you know, that means it's like, how can a person speak if they don't believe that their voice, uh, they have a voice, you know? Or how can a human being function if they don't consider they have a mind? And just the fact that we have the words such as the mind, just the fact that these words exist, like the mind, the concept of the soul in the dictionary, is a suggestion that human sight notice something else. You know, and it may be the case that human um, biology is a phase. I don't know yet. This, uh, this has to do with the collective decision-making of our species, you know. And the most important thing is to realize that the freedom has the free, uh, excuse me, the future has the freedom to make its own decision. I would say life, like the lifetime, the experience of living, it's as if there is 8 billion artists <clears throat> and there is one uh, giant canvas that we don't see the edge of the canvas, we can't see the edge of outer space. And because we can't see the edge of outer space, it's art. That means it's like, uh, 
you can say any person whether somebody consciously grabs a pen and draws something or somebody accidentally spills a bit of their coffee on a piece of paper both can be treated as art but one is consciously done one is unconsciously so human beings can consciously like everybody could be like love nature love nature love nature and the future generations are going to be like sorry ancestors we're going to be robots now i mean the future is going to make its own decision <clears throat> but the idea is that we don't forget our humanism it is the most ancient uh uh believe it or not it's like the most sacred thing right now People are in a biological universe and then their con their concept of metaphysics that which comes after nature or after the physics It's like in a natural world beyond nature, it's like because we're biological right now, <clears throat> the human biology is like the illusion and the beyond the known uh, sensory perception is like being considered the divine at least through religious, through the theological and uh, spiritualist perspective. But I would say in the future, I would give this 120 years from now maybe. <clears throat> in 120 years from now there's going to be children born in cyberspace and to them their divinity would be the natural human body So when time tested our humanity, our humanity tested time. That would be the most genius thing. You know, I call this uh, a sort of mirror uh, technique where many times, for example, I'll give you an example. For example, <clears throat> when I was, um, there was a point in my life where I lived in Iran uh, during my teenage years and I... I was attending this school called Tehran International School. It was like a Swiss, it was like a English based <coughs> uh, school. But in it, it was pretty much, <coughs> I think I was there at grade six. And uh, imagine, I, like I'm, 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 I'm sharing something from my past with the audience. So I was um, pretty much in, how do I explain it? I was in a school that was like similar to Fight Club and a lot of the <laughs> kids who were there were just angry, you know. And I remember there was a point where I had to confront people uh, in some sense with their anger, like you, I don't know how to say it, like in, in Iran there is an attitude uh, in Iranian culture where the attitudes like sit down, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> like the attitude, it's like it, it, it makes the person kind of sit down before they talk if the person gets angry but anyways it was a situation where I would use this mirror technique that when somebody if, if I had a problem with somebody or somebody came to bother me I would reflect to them the same amount of intensity they reflected or even more which means it's like a monster attacks you and you put the mirror in front of the monster and the monster gets afraid of itself because it hasn't seen itself that means this concept of how many monstrous algorithms or egoic archetypes are in motion and how many of uh, the conscious uh, consciousness that pilots those archetypes haven't even noticed what the archetype is <clears throat> you know it's like a warrior that's endlessly uh, killing warriors in a battlefield then at one moment he's like wait a minute what if I get killed and then the sword becomes heavier in the hand of the person and they put it down you know when we it's like when we feel something doesn't touch us then there comes the desire of the arrogant demigod <clears throat> you know there comes like the ignorant demigod desire you know where the person in their inner realms they feel they can do anything but it's as if they have just become ignorant of the outer realms you know <clears throat> because in this life because there is a cause and effect 
uh, modality, if we are cruel, there is a huge chance that our inner realms will be cruel to us. If you're a nice person, there's a, there will be a chance that your mind will be nice to you, you know? <clears throat> and if you, let's say, are an evil person and your mind is nice to you, let's say you enjoy evil, you got to be very car careful because most likely you've become a puppet at that point, a puppet of another force. Not, not like some metaphysical, you know, religious possession, but I'm saying <clears throat> evil is when um, the person doesn't care about the future. That's it. Because the only reason we're being good as human beings is because we care for the future. Because if the result of good action and bad action was the same, we wouldn't have good or bad, you know? <clears throat> and because we're creatures of continuity, we want to continue and we would like to continue efficiently, right? You know, there was a scene in the movie Batman, I don't know which movie it was, I think it might have been the first one. <clears throat> like the Batman Begins or something, I don't know, but there was a scene where Alfred, like Batman's butler, he looks at him and he says, some people just want to see the world burn, you know? And that was such a heavy statement. You know, that was one of those statements where I never thought, like, imagine you go to see an action movie and an existential question <laughs> gets thrown at you, you know? You're like, I just wanted to see Batman punch people in the face, but what is this? You know, why is, why is an existent, <laughs> you know? And so when you think about some people wanting to watch the world burn, you know why? The metaphysical can become instant. This is why in my school of thought, I'm telling people don't look for a face in the unknown. Don't try to contact a higher dimensional being in your inner realms. Do you know? Be preferenceless and if there is something other than you moving in your moment, you will notice it. Let me tell you why. Because it's like when someone, if right now I said like Ferrari, okay, let, let me imagine I'm, you're someone who doesn't have a Ferrari and you hear the word Ferrari and suddenly behind your eyes you see the image of a Ferrari, right? Now, some people see the image of the Ferrari, but at the same time the mind can see itself sitting in the Ferrari or the mind can see someone else sitting in the Ferrari. <clears throat> that means it takes one second of context shift to make uh, one's own thoughts into another being's voice in the inner realms. So there has to be a discrimination. When I say the logos, the most I would say the most best way to engage it is cinematically, not linguistically. Because when it's cinematic, there is design the design is getting access to but when it's sentence structure the sentence structure can have various motivations i'll give you <clears throat> an example like imagine somebody is walking you know is making a protein shake and suddenly feels uh, suddenly gets this thought like how would an extraterrestrial from the vega star system contact the human being if there was any right <clears throat> and the person suddenly gets this thought and it's like, yo, is this what potentially a Vega extraterrestrial would say? And then they suddenly notice that their protein, their protein powder was called Vega. Do you see what I mean? So the subconscious can take information from the outer realms and represent it in the different context that the free will chooses, right? So that means when it comes to any sort of metaphysical transcendentalist work, the person has to, in some sense, um, uh, seek, uh, ex have a direct experience beyond language to be able to retain a knowing. You see, we can play with thought, and it's very easy. We have been doing that from the beginning of our life. <clears throat> or we can use thought as probabilities which eventually as we experience as we go through the test of time it becomes evident what it is you know that means if i'm right now that person in history saying we're multidimensional beings if in the future we realize this then it's as if it becomes evident on its own you know there is no debate nature is uh, a movement and this movement has a display has an expression that's one of the coolest things about life <clears throat> one of the most incredible things about life is that uh, it has content
so self subjects began becoming accessible <clears throat> so really time exists to a subject and then an object really doesn't exist in time time is the mind's creation and <clears throat> time is how the world is moving pretty much that means if things begin reversing imagine uh, you know in mathematics they have this theory um, I think it was this was in this book called fractal time <clears throat> and so this mathematician was saying that um, time in mathematics can move backwards <clears throat> but uh, in reality it doesn't go backwards like you need a time machine for that And so if time can move backwards, it's a suggestion, imagine in the future, like imagine we live to the next thousand years and after the next thousand years, the whole history of the earth re rewinds like a film, imagine. You know, so it's all about how the world is presenting itself and how we are presented in the world as a self. It is very easy to get deceived but the point is if the person thinks about trying not to get deceived they're actually acting as if they're already deceived so <clears throat> pretty much time is an opportunity to control uh, to use the free will to sculpt a little part of the world that we are And so we will surpass the test of time by one, uh, not becoming extinct, <clears throat> by two, not allowing the biological gracefulness of our existence to be disturbed for that, and for there not to be an outer, to realize that let's say we found a way to never go extinct, now we would get bored, so the next chapter would be exploration. So we want to survive, and then if somebody says, why are you surviving, you're like, Oh yeah, why am I surviving? And the person's like, okay, so I ate food, drank water, slept, found shelter, adjusted temperature, you know? So, just so now we can be minds. And the mind's greatest act is exploration. That means I will tell you, <clears throat> um, tell me who is a better teacher. Uh, someone who uh, was the, someone who's an explorer or somebody who's relaying what an explorer has said. You will see the person who's explored it will give you the image for it. But the person who's just relaying will give you the concept. That means the idea, it's as if ideas are like made of language and images. <clears throat> or an idea is the language of an image. Or the language for an image. Or better way, it's the, it's how it, the image is being language. So pretty much, imagine you are like a translator, <clears throat> and you're translating a film into words and words into a film, and that is the game of human knowledge, currently. And anyone understands that the film is up to them to direct. This is what a lot of young children don't understand, you know. In my youth, I had no clue of this. That there is no greater pilot and there is no one on this earth that can see us like how we see ourselves. So we are our own pilot. And when I say timeless flights, of attention beyond the void I am that person in history saying that the end of language is the remembrance of a present that never went anywhere when Einstein says we created time so everything doesn't happen at once it's not that we just created time we created every concept known to man to fragment the realm you know and so it's as if there is psychologists 
uh, diagnosing people on the planet for fragmented psychology, not realizing to be a social entity means you need to have a fragmented psychology. Kind of like how the Japanese say, the man is the room he enters. So rather than us thinking we're one kind of person with one kind of suffering <clears throat> or one kind of success, it's as if we, uh, we zoom in, we put the film of the moment underneath a microscope and we begin to see that it's moment to moment to moment. That means somebody can have a successful film of life that means they're trying to just, uh, you know, uh, um, be one one stream of just like one smooth film of success. And then there are those who they they are literally. It's like they say you have won the battle but not the war, right? So the film is the war. The frames of the film are the battles. And our moment-to-moment -moment living is like a battle with, uh, not a battle, but an, a, a reacquaintance with the unknown variables and known variables of the moment. <clears throat> I am telling you, anybody who understands the known and the unknown, you will learn things very quickly. Because anything you hear, any field that can be studied, any branch of the tree of knowledge has an unknown and known them component to it. Literally, it's um, we're, we're, we are taking advantage of what Alan, Alan Watts said, polar thinking. That means if we're in a dualistic civilization, we want to max out our experience of duality. The moment we max out our experience of duality, it's like a been there, done that situation, and transcendence is automatical arising. So when somebody says timeless flights, this means remembering a singular movement. When someone says timeless flights of attention beyond the void, this means remembering beyond singularity. That means we're starting as creatures in a good and bad world, in a known and unknown world. Then we notice, at least the mystics and yogis did, that the known and the unknown are being witnessed simultaneously. So technically a singularity is experiencing a duality in the inner realms and in the outer realms the duality is experiencing a singularity so in front of our eyes chaos and order behind our eyes there's a single point of attention and energy being an instantaneous awareness <clears throat> so pretty much behind your eyes it's as if um, you know what it is it's as if they said uh, God is a metaphor for the soul or the soul is a metaphor for the extension of God, you know. I feel uh, it's 2021 now, so I would say by 2050, <clears throat> hopefully we've advanced communication. Pretty much what's going to happen is in the next 30 years, there's going to be the linguistic simulation is going to crack. <clears throat> you know, in us, in the Abrahamic tradition, in some of the texts, you know, revelatory texts, there's a suggestion that the, when the apocalypse comes, the sky is going to crack. And so I will tell you, the apocalypse of the inner realm is how language that is holding everything in, in, in a singular, in a, in a dualistic way, is realizing that it has a sing, it is sandwiched between the singular and the infinite. That means to a metaphysicist, a metaphysicist is not thinking of life and death. A metaphysicist is thinking of which should I choose, immortality or eternity. Eternity means the mind is free. Excuse me, uh, etern yeah, eternity means it's like the mind is freer than that you have found the freedom of the inner realms before the outer realms. And I would say uh, immortality is when you have found freedom in the outer realms before finding freedom in the inner realms. There's a story from Alexander the Great where Alexander the Great was this great conqueror and he's like, all right, I've conquered a lot of stuff now. The only thing I haven't conquered is time. 
So Alexander the Great realizes he hasn't conquered time yet. And so he gives a command to all those around him and he says, find me the fountain of youth. Find me the solution to, the, to immortality's Rubik's Cube, you know. And the Rubik's Cube didn't exist at that time, but you know what I mean. So he's saying, uh, find me an immortal solution. I have to conquer time as if that's my final opponent. <clears throat> and that's like the, the, the last boss of the simulation, you know. The final boss of the simulation. So somebody comes up, you know, some wise men from Alexander the Great's council come up to him and they're like, all right, man, so we found the fountain of youth, but it's, it, it's so strangely positioned where it's this giant cliff that goes vertically. That means he has to climb a vertical cliff and then there's a cave in the, in, in the middle suddenly and in that cave is the fountain of youth. <clears throat> so it's a solo journey. That means only uh, the person alone can reach the fountain of youth. It is not a. It's not um, dependent to the to another archetype. Anyways, so Alexander the Great at first thinks that uh, his people might want to like kill him. You know, what if there is no uh, cave and he just climbs and gets tired and falls? But then he has faith. He knows his own strength and he begins climbing the mountain. Alexander the Great climbs the mountain and there is a cave actually and his councilmen did not lie. And Alexander the Great goes into that cave and he sees that at the edge of the cave there is like a sort of river, you know? Sorry, not river, like some stream, like some sort of fountain, like uh, a thing, right? And so he goes there, imagine climbing a, a vertical mountain without rope or anything, <clears throat> you know? And so he goes and he's about to drink from the water and he hears this voice that says, don't drink it. And the Alexander the Great just pauses and he looks to his right uh, sorry, he looks around and he sees nothing in the cave. He goes to drink it again. He thinks he's hallucinating. Then he hears the voice again. And the voice says, don't drink it. You know? And he turns around and he sees there's a crow at the edge of the cave. A crow, a talking crow. And he, he says, why? And the crow says... I drank from this fountain of youth and I became immortal, but I became an immortal crow. And so Alexander the Great attains a sort of, you can say, enlightenment at that moment. And he doesn't drink from the fountain and he climbs down. He climbs down realizing that in just pretty much I would say if you look at the future of our species <clears throat> immortality is going to not only be potentially dehumanized and technological but it will be forgetting the natural beauty of life do you know that means a person may you know use artificial products may use artificial may consume artificial food right in the future but to have your world be artificial that is like a no you know what i mean You know, it's all about uh, hu humanity's, con our, our natural biological consciousness being the glow of a candle. And the glow of this candle deserving to stay 
uh, still lit in, in the universe. That means it's as if when hum human beings notice they will die, they were like, all right, now the only option is to only live. You know, and that living means you serve the dimensions of self honorably. Then you so serve the dimensions of others honorably. Then you serve the dimensions of your world. And finally, as all angles, I would say, of the uh, triangle of the psyche are, are uh, uh, realized to be in one circle, I will tell you the truth of man is nature and the truth of nature is man. Turn to, the, to nature's uh, ultimate truth. That means right now I will tell you as much as I'm a personality speaking to you, I am also an event of nature. You know, it's as if imagine if the trees could suddenly stand up, uh, talk, wear clothing, you know, use vehicles and in some sense uh, give a podcast. Do you know what I mean? It's as if we are a part of nature that has become alive. To itself at least, you know. That means for the first time our intelligence moved beyond our ecosystem's interpretation. Yeah. That means when you look at inferior species, nature was moving them. They were not moving themselves. We are that which can move itself in nature. And the idea of the self only exists because we have separated ourselves from the world. That means sometimes it's very hard to say if a tree is, is the earth or is on the earth. You know, it's as if it's very hard to say if the dirt we find the earth on, like, you know, the ground, like the soil. It's very hard to say if the soil is the earth or it's on the earth. You see, it's as if where do we draw uh, at, at, at what layer of the onion uh, of our planet do, you, do we accept? <laughs> you know, we are not uh, creatures with endless energy. We are creatures that uh, have a certain opportunity. I would say the act of living is just opportunity. You know, that means it's as if there's some people, you know, uh, trying to escape death. And there's some people who don't even consider the concept of death because it hasn't happened yet. You know, <clears throat> and instead of thinking of death, they're like, okay, all I know right now is life, you know. It's as if we have entered an art gallery and we're looking at one of these art gallery, uh, one of the uh, artwork in the gallery, and the artwork is the human life. And I personally will be, you know, I, um, <clears throat> you know, there's some people who their metaphysical landscape that means the, their inner realms um, has a, their relationship with the logos is a relationship with uh, one singular truth. For me, I would say my relationship is not just with the one singular truth, and it's not that I don't consider one singular truth. I, I have, I've kind of been there, done that. You know, I have experienced uh, from the year 2014 to 2016, I was pretty much, at least in my own eyes, I was in Samadhi pretty much all those years. And what that means is that uh, my, I, my inner identity was not dependent on uh, the cause and effect of the outer realms. And so what it is, it's as if imagine a mind is an unknown technology. That means every person who has a different DNA right now, imagine you're, you're a unique human technology that no other human being on this planet has ever seen before. And so... <clears throat> this technology is left in the lifetime to activate, you know. It's as if before the person looking for truths in language, the person's like, yo, it's like a first person video game, this life. You know, it's as if it's intentionally designed. We look through our eyes rather than have a 3D RPG kind of drone angle of perception on ourselves. That means our eyes are on our face, our eyes are not above our head seeing our body. You know, 
and there is uh, I would say uh, schools of uh, mysticism where they consider that the soul should not be in the body the soul should be outside of the body and that's how the soul should utilize the body that means it's, it's it's like this idea that first of all they're considering another dimension kind of Rene Descartes mind body dualism but with, with a more deeper context <clears throat> and so it's as if like a person's soul uh, think of it as if it, it think of it as if our bio, uh, our biological existence is a vehicle of some sort and think of it that right now the attention is a driver and the attention is not the biology but it is finding itself in the vehicle of biology now if there was a chance that you are your whole moment you're not just a part of it it would suggest that you're actually never inside your body the body is inside the soul that means it's as if the outer realms have got it upside down we think we're a body that has a mind and that has a soul but i'm telling you there is a soul that has projected a mind and then from that mind there is projected a body so really the um i would say the transition from this life would be an avalanche of the physical realm into the mental realm and then the mental realm into the only uh, into the into the only You know, I wrote a poetry book actually called The Only, you know. Let me see if I can read something from it. <clears throat> the soul of mankind is just how much it cares to enter the future. If we don't enter the future, we have no soul. If we enter the future, it's as if we have always been our eternity. Okay, here guys, I found the PDF. So um, uh, I'm going to read from this uh, poetry work of mine, guys, and uh, it's on, it's um, this will soon be published in the Mr. Within's library bookstore coming soon. So I'm going to read the third poem from, uh, I wrote this in 2015, The Only. Uh, there we go. The poem is called, these are mystical kind of <clears throat> hymns that I wrote in 2015. Anyways, the poem is called Found in Greater Smiles. Can you summon silence? Can you forget ideology and step onto the softest grasslands of your being? Can life's embrace be felt with a reality with intruders? Your blindness is your gift. Take your lessons only from the light of your awareness. 
All ships have set sail. There is no one else with you in this apocalypse. For the mind was never the mind, and I have never spoken. In the glare in your eye there lies a torch, in the hand of a stranger you shall never meet. But smile like sunrise, for there is a moth around that flame who is willing to speak. Kiss your own forehead, and smile as you emanate within eyes that were never dreaming. So, um, So there's 26 poems in this, guys. I'm gonna, just because this is a live stream and why not, <clears throat> viewers can s uh, select a number between uh, one, uh, 1 to 26 out there, then, yeah. Okay, here, let's say from 3 to 26. Okay guys, there's one viewer but three likes to the video. I'll read number 13 and I'll go back to the topic. So, the 13th poem from the poetry work, the only uh, that will be published soon for viewers, it's, it's called The Chaos That Pulls the Sage. Let me see if I can... Uh, A man once stood over his grave before his birth. How cruel could life be to create such a thing? In that same graveyard, an insane man was playfully running through the mist. Could this eluded being be lost within a greater truth? As observance listened, as it, cho as it chose, the insane man began to speak. O oh, beloved audience in the mist, I have spoken to some wise walls who could never give me a curved answer. The ambivalence of a kind man is the observance that is the gift of the unkind. Do not torture yourself when you never could. 
in the shadow of another shadow, the light may, be, may seem to be hard to find. But learn from the drops of wisdom and find the stream that carries your direction. An annihilation of all paths is a rare gift. Who has been so kind to let you walk with uncertain truths in a monastery? If God could speak, it has already spoken. You are the traveler of your own journey and the mountain too. Chaos was never a gift for the cruel. For only the allowance of a compassionate mind may keep the hidden unhidden to you. Do not fear the mystery of the unknown, for your heart has awaited this journey from time immemorial. For all the doorways have invisible doors, when kindness blooms you have found home. Take the last step into your home. W-H-O-O, into your home. That means, believe it or not, the final end of all is everything. That means the end of everything is, the end of nothing is everything, and the end of everything is nothing, you know? So it's literally like a coin. <laughs> Spinning coin, you know? Consciousness is like the attention, the, the soul's like, wait a minute, was I just something, everything a minute ago, and now I'm nothing? It's like, <laughs> and then the soul's like, wait a minute, was I nothing a minute ago, and now I'm everything? Yeah. And the Buddha's like, step out of samsara, kid. <laughs> Anyways, guys, uh, thanks for listening. Before I end off, I'll just do a quick overview of, um, <clears throat> so here's, here's the thing, from my perspective as one human among 8 billion human beings in a universe with a billion trillion stars where there's an on and off effect of the sun and also our consciousness and unconsciousness, in a changing world where if the world is changing that means the selves inside the world are also changing. So in a changing world, we are living like nouns when the world is a verb and our suffering is when the nouns change. That means somebody could be like, I'm the best uh, uh, dancer in the world, you know? And then the moment they see another dancer, they'll be like, oh, <laughs> do you know? So it's as if, so what, what I mean by that is like, <laughs> The archetype changes in contact with newer dimensions. So the purpose of life is exploration of reality. And uh, as this great Japanese show by the name of Shingeki no Kyojin, there was a fictional character who said, life is not meaningless. Uh, we find meaning by living for those who will find the meaning one day. That means the meaning of life is advancement for the self and the collective. The collective is not a bad idea, but it has been the case that we have not experienced an efficient collective movement. And strangely, I feel it's as if like technology is a gift from the gods if wielded correctly. That means just think about the psychology of the inventor. The inventor was some guy who was just walking around, saw something, saw something that could be invented in a better way, you know, kind of like how Michelangelo says, uh, he was a sculptor, he says, I saw the angel in the stone and I set it free, and the inventor sees the invention in his inner realms and he sets it free into the outer realms, you know. 
So how the inventor does is that the idea occurs to him through circumstance. So it's literally the inventors are an antenna, you know, and they re receive a sort of signal and that signal uh, they, they can choose to dedicate it to the outer realms or the inner realms, you know. I would say there are those on the planet who invent new objects and those who invent new subjects, you know. I totally feel there is the idea of a subjective inventor. You know, we have invented civilization from silence with our language, with our voice. I mean, you know, there's way more freedom in the intellectual domain than the, uh, a sort of ignorant... Uh, how can I tell you? It's as if... When I look at the educational systems of our world, I'm like, oh man, it's like, it's like you see someone uh, not using their potential. Like the educational system is not at its full potential. <sighs> Ultimately, I would say, um, realize you are the presence of your whole moment, whoever you are and realize that's where inner peace and outer peace is. Because anything that is a segmented individual, it is in relation to some uh, collective, right? So anyways, guys, I hope this episode was helpful and there's more to say on this topic, of course, and there is, a, there is something that we as human beings should protect and it's the graceful nature of our human life. That means it's as if that's something that every human being, whether good or bad, should care to be a guardian of the biologically natural. You know, that means all the good guys and bad guys in civilization were like, yo, are we going to become robots in the future? You know, it's like, it's like, you know, we got to do something, you know, so it would be a sort of union of chaos and order uh, of a biological dimension to retaliate against the chaos and order of a uh, technological or cyberspace dimension. You know, it's not that, that means the war, there is, there is not going to be a war between man and machine because man has already relied on the machine. So there's no way man will fight machines in the future because we need them. You know, we're living in a social way where without technology, it, it's like how many people can find presence of mind, you know. Our eyes open and there's an incredible value in that. And the journey of the lifetime is to realize that. That means realize how your eyes being open as a creature in the space-time continuum is the newest thing, the most advanced thing that this universe has done. That means the human being is like, like Earth is probably bragging, you know, to the, uh, to, to the moon about how like, <laughs> of how Earth is its greatest, ma that's how human beings are the greatest masterpiece of the guy in mind, you know. That means imagine it and uh, imagine this uh, from a theological sense. God is like an art artist, and man is like the artwork. And now imagine the artwork realizing uh, it is in some sense uh, uh, um, realizing how it is like imagine an artwork fascinated with itself. God, it's as if the uh, the creator artist would be in some sense like no way my artwork even loves itself. It's so incredible. <laughs> You know, and so that would be where blessings reign, you know. You know, there was this character video game, this very old video game to modern audiences now, <clears throat> known as Warcraft Frozen Throne. And uh, there was a character, a specific champion in this, uh, that had this ability <clears throat> where in the middle of a battle he would just rain down on a giant spot just healing this healing ability you know <laughs> and
and I would say when one realizes there it's okay that the world is unknown that means it's as if like all parents should teach their children <clears throat> it's okay that sometimes the world is known you notice the known variables and sometimes you notice not known variables you know and when you when the unknown variables are more than 50 per percent all you can do is accept you just accept all right the unknown is unknown you know <laughs> and when the known variables are more than 50 percent that's when you should try to not let yourself forget the unknown you know that means if you're a person who right now feels like what you see is truth you got to remember the unknown if you're a person right now who thinks what you're looking at is nothing, you gotta remember the note. You know? <laughs> Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Much blessings and I'll listen. I'll be on Discord um, for uh, 10 minutes for those in interested in questions and whatnot. I'll listen. And one last thing.